Welcome to Lessons from the Playroom. In this podcast, Lisa Dion will help you explore the little things that make a big difference in play therapy. Lisa is a founder of Synergetic Play Therapy. You know, sometimes therapists get all caught up trying to study big theories and mastering techniques to help children like me. But sometimes it's the little things we show you along the way that make the biggest difference. Join Lisa as she teaches you some of the little lessons that children are trying to communicate to you so that you can help us in the best ways possible. And on behalf of all the kids you work with, thanks for listening and believing in us. Let's get started. Hi, listeners. Thank you once again for joining me for the Lessons from the Playroom podcast. I have another amazing guest on our episode today. Dr. Bonnie Goldstein. Um, We're going to get into sensory motor psychotherapy work, specifically with children, and I'm so excited for this conversation with Bonnie. Um, For those of you that are not familiar with Bonnie, let me go ahead and tell you a little bit um, about her. Um, She is the founder and the director of the Lifespan Psychological Center. Um, She's also a faculty member at the Sensory Motor Psychotherapy Institute. And one of the cool things that we're going to talk about later, everyone, is that um, she has a manuscript right now. Now, um, at Norton Publishing, where she and Pat Ogden have written a book on sensory motor psychotherapy work with kids. I'm so excited to hear more about that, um, Bonnie. Um, she's written other books. Um, she teaches around the world. She does so many things. She has so many different um, accolades, but truly, um, Bonnie, what I know of you is that you have a heart of gold in this work and are really out there to make a huge difference with kids and families. And, uh, and I, I am so excited that you're a guest um, on this podcast. So thank you so much for joining me. And thank you. It's so lovely to be part of this community that you've created and to embrace people on this journey together on how we can utilize our own sense of self Mm -hmm. and our work with our clients. I'm hoping both to give tools and also ideas for ourselves as therapists, as parents, Mm -hmm. as helpers of the next generation coming up, and really to help with tools with our clients, our younger clients and their families. Yeah, absolutely. Bonnie, should we start by sharing with everyone how we met? Love it. Love it. <laughs> it was um, a, a random, but um, not random uh, meeting in, in that years ago, you and I were both over in Melbourne, Australia at the uh, International Trauma Conference, the Australian um, Childhood Foundation was putting on their their um world-renowned trauma conference, and uh, and we both found ourselves at dinner one night in the same group of individuals, and, uh, and, and, and Bonnie, I don't know what your experience was, but I know for me at the end of the night, you and I were like cuddled up, <laughs> we were like holding hands, and like, it was like an immediate like, hi, I like you. <laughs> you have the sense of joie de vivre or joy <laughs> about you. And as we kept on speaking, we could see how our paths were integrating, even though I'm based in Los Angeles yes. and you're in Colorado. It felt like we were kindred spirits. And I know meeting over at dinner in, uh, in Melbourne. And so this conversation has been a long time, long time coming. And it's lovely to lovely to see you again and to be able to talk with you. So, Bonnie, I would love for you to share with everyone. How did you you're talking about paths. What's your, what was your path? How did you find your way into the world of sensory motor psychotherapy? For many of us, uh, my cohorts and myself who had studied psychodynamic psychotherapy, psychoanalytic psychotherapy in the 80s and 90s, found ourselves realizing that there are missing pieces. Oh. And through my lens, I was initially trying to understand things such as how the body influences the mind, Mm -hmm. how mindfulness and mind-body awareness Mm -hmm. come together and create shifts, shift the narratives. Mm -hmm. We all as clinicians have had those patients who are stuck Mm -hmm. or patients who find themselves going to one therapist and then the next one and the next one, carrying the same concerns, but really not crossing over. 
So initially, when I started studying in 2003 with Dr. Ogden, with Dr. Pat Ogden, it was all about learning tools to bring back to my existing practice. Mm -hmm. And then over the course of learning about the somatic awareness, the somatic body, somatic intervention, and really reshaping mm -hmm. the experience that is imprinted, the procedural learning, the impact of earlier experiences on how we present in the world, that I found myself becoming more of what I'll consider a body-based therapist, a sensory motor psychotherapist, utilizing talk therapy, uh -huh. also coming in from bottom up. So top down, looking at the words, but not just the words, mm -hmm. then looking at the body and interweaving the two. Mm -hmm. So um, what was it in your, in your uh, exploration that made you go, hmm, I want to figure out how to do this with kids. I want to open up the conversation and bring sensory motor work into the realm of children and, and, and families. Because originally, if I'm correct, it was really just focused on adults. And, and you've been with Pat, you've, you've been bringing it into bringing it to the littles. <laughs> bringing it to the littles and to the littles and all of us adults. Yeah. Because the beauty of the sensory motor psychotherapy lens is we're working with parts of ourselves from younger ages. Mm -hmm. And when one's studying the developmental impingers, the developmental traumas, mm -hmm. those moments that we've all had mm -hmm. and how they imprint our lives, I started utilizing some of the exercises that in the experiential trainings we were doing for ourselves. Mm -hmm. In the trainings, we have a partner that we're working with, another therapist. We're practicing some of these tools on them. I took those into the office started practicing with my clients. I would say to parents, I've been learning some new ways of looking at these issues. What if we try, what if we look at, or I'd say to the kids, I'm curious. Now that's one of the best pieces of sensory motor psychotherapy is collaborative curiosity together. So I might say that, I wonder what happens if, or I would take an exercise, perhaps a breath exercise mm -hmm. that say I'm working with a child or I'm working with a teenager. And I notice that as they start to tell the story, maybe their shoulders go in or their head goes down. In fact, you're doing it right now. What yes. All of you, as you watch Lisa and I watch our shoulders, mm -hmm. our head go down, the tightness that we experience. Mm -hmm. Now in this posture, Perhaps I've just told about a traumatic experience. I'm no longer making eye contact. Try to take a deep breath. It's very difficult. I hear as I'm teaching. It's very I'm challenging. It's very constricted. So I would say to a child, hey, I have a trick. I notice your shoulders are in, your heads are down. Let's together see what happens if, and then I start opening my arms. Let's see what happens if I open my arms and I sit up. Huh, let's take a breath. Mm -hmm. Notice what's happening right now in this moment. And I might see things such as they're breathing better, thinking of one very traumatized boy. He started pulling at his shirt, goes, I'm having a hard time. And he was on the edge of a panic mm -hmm. or a reaction to talking about this horrific childhood experience. Mm -hmm that he was reliving in the office. Mm -hmm. So we were able to drop beneath the words, mm -hmm. first with this body posture, mm -hmm. then with resourcing his body mm -hmm. and slowing things down. I'm noticing even as I'm teaching, mm -hmm. I'm slowing down along with what I'm teaching, but that was the experience in the office. Yeah. In a sense, I was helping him to co-regulate. Mm -hmm. I helped him to sit back, mm -hmm. open up, to notice his breath. Mm -hmm. At one point, I suggested he puts his hand on his heart. Mm -hmm. This exercise through our mindfulness community has been done for so many years, and it's embedded in the sensory motor psychotherapy work, but it's more of a relational, embedded relational mindfulness mm -hmm. where I might notice what's happening. I might say, hey, even I'm noticing whatever comes up as I'm working with a client. Yeah. And with that example of the boy I'm thinking of, he was a six-year-old 
And as he's talking about the trauma and the violation he experienced, and he's losing his breath, the first thing we needed to do was we wanted to help him ground himself, feet on the ground, yeah. helped him put his hands on his legs and knees and notice and come back into contact with me. Mm -hmm. And he was willing to try things because it was done, proposed in the spirit of, hey, why don't we try? Or mm -hmm. I have an idea. Or I might say to someone who comes in, I'm thinking of another traumatized girl who came in, speaking a mile of minute, never taking a breath, and the words as a defense, as a protection. And at one point, she took a breath. Oh. And I said, whoa, that was a big breath after all those words. Mm -hmm. It's really great that you can take a breath. Mm -hmm. Take your time. We have all the time we need. You can take time to breathe mm -hmm. in between your talking. And I remember her, she peeked up at me. Mm -hmm. And she came from a very large family where you had to speak quickly because someone would sneak in on you. You had to, they had at dinner, they would have a bucket of chicken. And she would describe that they got the big buckets of Kentucky fried chicken. But if she didn't grab quickly, she'd be left with a wing. Mm. She described it just like that. Left. You it's can see wing. the connection in her body. You can feel it. Mm. You can feel it. So I went right with yeah, I can see right now as you think about that, that if you don't go very quickly or use your words or use your body or grab at, there won't be anything left for you. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, she slowed down and you could see the tears come to her eyes. And we could drop into the moment mm -hmm. of being together, mm -hmm. dropping beneath the words, slowing things down. I'm thinking of all of the exercises mm -hmm. that we learn as adults mm -hmm. for working with our adult population in sensory motor psychotherapy. But if we go back to your question, they all seem so ripe for trying out with kids. Mm -hmm. So I set up my video camera back before we all had iPhones. This is dating where now any of us can pop our iPhone on a little tripod and we're set, push a button. So I had all my video equipment and I found kids love to be videotaped. More importantly, they and their parents would love to watch the session that we videotaped, at which point I could use it as psychoeducation. They see here, look at this minute, what your body did. And if we go back to this posture, they could see their body in this posture. Yeah. I also have a mirror in all in, we have a series of offices. Mm -hmm. In our offices, we have a mirror that are freestanding. We can pull them out and have the mirror beside us so that we can tilt it mm -hmm. towards our younger clients and show them what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. In the video, you can catch clients looking at the video of themselves, noticing with us, mm -hmm. noticing what happened right before. So that's where the beauty of sensory motor psychotherapy, it's not just noticing the body-based movement. Mm -hmm. It's going with what we notice, following that, yeah. using that to notice what pre-existing beliefs, thoughts, feelings, what transpired and how it informs our body. I'll give you another example of that. I'm thinking of a really young child and she's now... 17 and she's given us permission to show her videos from when she was four so oh, when wow. we do the sensory motor training for kids we're able to show the videos and have pieces of her reflecting on her memory of herself back then she's four years old adorable little girl comes in and you can see she just wants to disappear and her body tells us that the way she sits so i comment on that and i say Looks like you just want to be all cocooned up. Let's do that together. And we took pillows, part of the props in our office, and piled up the pillows. And she says, this feels great. As we're piling up pillows, yeah, this feels great. And at one point, she had pillows everywhere, including all on top of her. And there was a little people. Mm -hmm. So she could see out. Mm -hmm. I couldn't see in. And she loved that. Mm -hmm. And she laughed about that. Mm -hmm. And then as we spoke further, she was able to use her hands and do this. And she was able to let go 
of all those pillows with the biggest laugh. And as she did that, and as she started to laugh, you could see her body settle. She felt safe in the room. And then we were able to work with big feelings and small feelings and titrating the two. At one point, we had her do the choo-choo train game. This is a game that Pat Ogden taught me um, that we speak about for kids of all ages, adults too. But for this little one, she would go in the room as a choo-choo train, jumping from blocks to blocks. Choo, 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 very slow. And then I'd say, now what happens if the train speeds up? Choo, 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 choo. Choo, choo. Now this is all on tape. She's watching herself learn to regulate through the play. Mm -hmm. As we start to look at the meaning beneath, we spoke, spoke about her family constellation, the presenting issue, she had a parents who were breaking up. There was very little supervision and she had two older brothers that would physically beat up on each other. And she was very clever. She thought, I don't wanna be in the middle of that. They never touched her because she learned to disappear while being in a room. Mm -hmm. We had an image she and I of the Wicked Witch in the Wizard of Oz where I'm melting. Mm -hmm. That was her. She would be able to melt away, almost disappear. Now that worked and was very effective in her family so that she didn't get pounced on. Yeah. When she went to school, that became problematic mm -hmm. because she was the child who didn't speak, who disappeared. Her body language was this, she was hesitant. The label slow to warm up comes to mind. So many different things were going on for her in an environment such as meeting me. And so yeah. we have to utilize some of the tools of sensory motor through the lens of play. Yeah. And that's an example of how we might look at big and small, doing it with breath, big breath, small breath, body movements, big and small, pushing boundaries, all of these exercises that are ones we look at in sensory motor psychotherapy, but applying them now to children. All right, listeners, don't go anywhere. More to come after this short break. Hi, listeners. I'm gonna ask you to step out of the playroom for just a second so we can talk business. I'm talking about the business of therapy. That's right, the course that you need and likely never had. Here's the deal, we all have dreams. For you, it might be to start your private practice or move into a group practice. Maybe it's becoming a world-class presenter, writing a book or launching a podcast. Whatever your dream is, it is important and I wanna help you get it out into the world. Join me in person or live virtually in Denver, Colorado on November 11th through 13th. If you've ever wondered how neuroscience applies to making money, overcoming fears, creating strategic plans, time management and all things business, then this is a lesson that you won't wanna miss. I hope to see you there. Get all the details at learn.synergeticplaytherapy.com. So um, it's so beautiful, Bonnie. I, I am I'm a firm believer that if the the therapy does not include the body, it's really missing. I mean, it's, it's just missing a pretty significant piece of the uh, of the puzzle. And um, I've always had a real deep appreciation for sensory motor psychotherapy, and um, you know. I, someone said to me one time, they said, is it really important to know the narrative of the developmental trauma? Like, do you have to, do you have to go back and do you have to know it? And, and what I shared in the moment was, you do know it. It's right in front of you. It's beautiful. Yes. It's right there. You do know it. It's right you there. Know. It's right there. And, and, and what I'm hearing you say is that so much of, um, uh, sensory motor psychotherapy work is 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 um, reading that story and reading the story through the body and working with the story in its aliveness in the body and um, I'm saying that so please correct me if I'm wrong as I as I as I'm saying that if that's not quite it but um, but that's the felt that's the felt sense as I'm hearing you speak and and as I'm hearing your your examples and it's um it's there's there's so much richness in in going through the going through the body so brilliant that was yeah. said just so accurately 
if we look at the sensory motor psychotherapy training and all of the readings, Pat Ogden has three books, you can, okay. as an audience, mm -hmm. get those books, start to learn about the concepts, they all apply to kids. But as you said, it's right there, the felt sense, mm -hmm. the somatic, the body, yeah. all right at our fingertips. We just haven't yet learned to ask the questions or look. Yeah. And that's, that raises another point. It's always collaborative. Yeah. We're not taking anyone anywhere they don't want to go. Mm -hmm. Con consistently asking, how would it be if, how mm -hmm. do you feel now? Mm -hmm. Is it okay if we, mm -hmm. and whenever someone says no, really reinforcing that. I'm so glad you were able to set a boundary with me. Okay. I'm so glad you recognize that right now that's not a good time or maybe not ever, mm -hmm. that boundary. And then I might bring up, I use my hands to set up boundaries. You let me know with your words boundaries. And that opens another chapter of different ways to set personal boundaries or to be able to do something we couldn't do when we were kids. Mm -hmm. As kids, we're not equipped perhaps to say no. Some kids never learned how to effectively set a boundary or a space for themselves. When they tried, they were squashed. Yeah. Their spirit was squashed. Yeah. So my personal experience and my own training understanding around attunement leads me to understand that I actually can't read someone else's body or story well unless I can read my own or unless I have a, a sense of my, my own story that's alive in my own, in my own body. Um, will you speak to that part of um, that part of the work? Cause I think that that's a conversation that needs to happen more and more and more in our therapy field around like what, what what's happening on this side of the, of, of, of the equation and what, what do we need to do over here from an embodied, from a body-based perspective so that we actually can attune to and, and do the very things that, that you are, um, that, that you're talking about. Will you, will you speak to that a little bit? I'm so glad you asked that question. When we look traditionally at traditional psychotherapy, before we become an analyst, we have our own experience of analysis mm -hmm. so we can know ourselves better. Mm -hmm. If we embrace that concept through the lens of sensory motor psychotherapy, the training itself, mm -hmm. the learning how to do the model, yeah. using our own experience, our own body, we're learning about ourselves mm -hmm. in every session. Mm -hmm. I am now highly attuned to my experience in ways mm -hmm. that I never used to be before. Mm -hmm. oh, I'll give you a perfect example. In days long ago, when I felt sleepy in the midst of a session, and haven't we all as therapists yeah. had clients with which we repetitively, we find ourselves sleepy, mm -hmm. I would do an interpretation. Something's not being said. Something's not happening in the room. But now I'm able to utilize that experience. Mm -hmm. Check in with myself. I check in with my body. Mm -hmm. I might even raise it with my clients saying, seems like right here, right now, something may be missing for you or for me. And I'm noticing my body feels a bit sluggish and it wasn't that way prior. Let's notice together what's going on. Or I might, I worked with kids where they come in and they lay down and go to sleep. And I'll say, hey, let's go downstairs and make a cup of hot cocoa. Or we could take a walk around the block. We have a therapy dog that's in all of our sessions. We can take the puppy on a walk. I have a room with a swing that is the most effective child-friendly room. <laughs> Indoor swing that it's butts up against the wall so you can swing freely. But when you're feeling, say, sluggish or angry, you can sit in the swing and kick against the wall. Mm -hmm. And I have, again, videotapes, thinking of one of the boys who comes in with his dad and we do a family session together and the father's busy saying, here's what you did wrong. You can see the boy getting angry because he likes coming to Bonnie as long as we don't have to talk about the problems. Mm -hmm. So he then sits in the swing and kicks against the wall and kicks hard against the wall. We luckily have plywood walls. Mm -hmm. They're um, very strong, firm plywood walls butting up against the swing so he can swing freely. But if he wants to, he extends his leg, 
kicks against the wall while dad is talking about the problems. And then it allows him to tolerate yeah. all the feelings and all the anger and all that's going on. And I'm checking in back to your question about what's going on in my body. Because I also, do I take care of dad's needs to talk about the problem? Take care of what I'm noticing happening right now, which is this boy wants to bolt. You can see it in his legs. His legs start getting activated. He's ready to get up and leave the room. But the swing allows him to tolerate being in there. And as he's kicking against it, we're twirling on the swing. There's a sense of calm that happens. There's a sense of ease that he's able to tolerate even hearing about his most problematic behavior. And with this boy, and again, this on the video, you'll see him, he lets us know when he needs a break, he, when he wants to say, dad, stop. And he might do this a lot, putting up his hand. Dad then takes a breath. You ready? No, not yet. Okay, are you ready now? So he's controlling not the topic, but the rate at which he has to hear about his misbehaviors, problem issues, challenges. And so this boy was able to stay in the room with us, laugh playfully. He loved being able to do that where he puts his hand up. He loved being able to control with the swings because then at the end, he could let go and he would swing backwards and he would laugh and laugh and laugh. And that became for him a joyous, concomitant to troubling yeah. dialogue with dad. Yeah. So it's, again, one of the many props that we have found, we also have a hammock in our office, mm -hmm. in our outdoor office. So we have lots of different movement and ways of moving, weighted blankets, lots of the tools, every tool that an occupational therapist might utilize can be woven in. And as we've discussed in some of our papers and on the sensory motor psychotherapy website, there are some free workshops that at the onset of the pandemic, I offered one, Pat Ogden and I offered one. Um, there are others that are either low fee or free that you can access to get more of description of these kinds of tools. And of course the trainings, mm -hmm. there's nothing more powerful than trainings to learn the tools as therapists so that we can learn, as you were asking about, Lisa, we can learn about our bodies, mm -hmm. about our reactions, mm -hmm. about what happens inside of us when a client's issues create for us so much transference or perhaps counter-transference where we get so triggered in response to our clients or they get so triggered in response to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's uh yes. I'm just over here going, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> That's if therapy is not playful, we will lose our kids. And if we look back to um Yak Panksef, the late, he passed away a few years ago, but he speaks about the import of play, the essential nature of play as part of healing and as part of wellness and working with those play centers in the brain as he did in his research therapy for us becomes play yeah much of the time i'm following our clients but i'm also in my own way redirecting so that i'm not just a playmate but we're doing therapeutic interventions through the lens of play you know what I also love about this conversation, particularly in the context of this podcast, since it is mostly play therapists, I find that play therapists um, can sometimes become attached to this idea that you have to use toys, right? Or that that play is, a, is something that requires toys or miniatures, or you have to have an office full of what, what toys traditionally would be, would be looked at, even though culturally not every culture has toys like we do in the Western world and, and whatnot. And, um, and I often find that play therapists forget that, um, that the body, if we're going to go with toy, right, the body, the relationship, uh, the therapist, like we are, 
we are essentially the most important ingredient, um, you know, in the, in the space. And, and I, and I love that also about what you're saying is that the work isn't dependent upon something you have in a room, you know, the, the work isn't dependent upon filling your space with certain things or, necessarily analyzing the metaphor of the things that you were using and and that kind of thing but it's it's more about what what, what's arising right now in you in this moment in me between us and 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 um there's something really um i think um profound about that really bonnie um it's there's a depth to it that's really quite extraordinary when we're when we're when we're using this right here the most important toy you're saying is their own body and body awareness, our own body and the dance, even if we're not physical and working with kids doesn't necessitate Mm -hmm. physicality. We're working with push, which is one of the Bonnie Brainbridge Cohen movements that we'll work with. We can use a pillow, Mm -hmm. pushing the pillow against our clients and they push back or pull, we can use a rope. Uh, There are, so many props that are not toys. And we have many pebbles. When you walk up to our office, we have a large fountain and uh, the sounds of trickling water. And then we could take a pebble and explore grasping the pebble, holding the pebble, letting go of the pebble, each of these movements, integral to sensory motor psychotherapy. What are we letting go of? And those pebbles and the letting go become a toy all its own. Mm -hmm. Color. Mm-hmm. I am such a proponent of color in the offices and choices. As I said, our, my associates and I, we have four offices plus an outdoor office. Thank you, COVID. One of the gifts of COVID is I've been working outdoors with clients mm-hmm. in an outdoor Zen garden. Mm-hmm. And there's a natural sense of choice. So mm-hmm. I'll say to my clients, which office do you want to work in today? They probably will go for the, either the outdoor with the <laughs> or the swing office, or what we call the treehouse office upstairs, because it is upstairs and we've made it feel very much like a treehouse because we're surrounded by trees. We have one large group office Mm -hmm. because for our older kids, for our tweens and teens, sensory motor psychotherapy groups are so important. Mm -hmm. And Lisa, I'll get you a couple of the articles that I've written, Mm -hmm. one of them with Pat Ogden, a couple on my own about working in group utilizing sensory motor psychotherapy so that our listeners can glean some of the tools that I haven't had a chance to discuss, but in one large room with nothing but similar chairs or similar seating spaces so that you're able to have cozy, comfortable, the pillows and the blankies become the the toys, scarves, a bag of scarves and different um we have lots of different size balls large exercise balls small balls half balls of bossy balls mm-hmm. often when you're talking say with a parent and child there's a height differential and so i try to have the eye gaze similar mm-hmm. so i'll have the little kids on the biggest balls mm-hmm. and then i'll have the parent on the tiny ball so that they're just the right eye level which that's a tool that years and years ago, when I studied with Virginia Satir so many years ago, and they were looking at the family therapy yeah. modality, mm-hmm. she had an exercise that would have a child stand up very tall mm-hmm. onto a table, onto a chair, supportedly safe, mm-hmm. and have the parents stretch down on the ground. What's it like for yeah. you as the child, usually the identified client or the identified patient, having them talk to their parents yeah, and then switching it. Mm-hmm. And it's a very interesting thing with eye gaze mm-hmm. and safety and self-regulation mm-hmm. and being able to use eye gaze to self-regulate. And One of the um, videos, Bonnie, that, um, that I've seen of your, of your work with, um, with that, uh, with children was, um, you have a friend that just, that just joined you. <laughs> I let the audience know what's so noisy. This is our therapy dog. And Milo, for some of you who've seen the older tapes or will, they're yeah. on the, Milo was on the video and now Brooklyn has taken over as the therapy dog. So that's the ambient background noise for any of you who are hearing a whistling or a whispering. Sorry about that. 
There's a, there's a friend in the background. <laughs> In this video, Bonnie, you have, um, if I if I remember correctly, it's a it's a young boy and his parents, and um, you have him. He's lying down on the ground, and he there's a yoga ball, and he is instructing. If I remember this correctly, they're taking the yoga ball and they're they're rolling the yoga ball up and down his body for some proprioceptive um, input. Um, I, am I remembering this 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 oh, this, wow. this this video? Uh, and and I remember in the video there there was something quite lovely about it where he was giving them instruction about how to how to move the ball, how much pressure to put on the ball, and uh, and it was just a a beautiful moment of of watching a child um, become aware of what he needed, ask for it have the parents in an attuned way res respond back. And um, it was, it was a lovely, it was a lovely clip. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I know we're talking about, you have your, your story of, of the one parent, and then we're talking about different family things and you can use the families too, is I guess what I wanted the audience to know, because I've seen it. I've seen a part of a video where, where um, the child really got to be empowered in that process. Now, that was one of my favorite sessions, and the family has been kind enough to let us use it when we're teaching the child trainings. Um, this was the identified patient in the family, the problem boy, everything, blame, 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 as parents often do. And then there's the perfect sibling, as families' dynamics are. And so when we took this large ball, and he, he had some of the um expected responses of an ADD high energy boy with a little sister mm -hmm. so he was always moving and wiggling and I think there was trauma because the second child was cesarean so his little sister kept mom away for five days mm -hmm. and it wasn't explained mm -hmm. um, when mom and the little sister came home he wasn't able to return her Mm -hmm. to wherever she came from, she was there to stay. And so those were some of the presenting issues. Mm -hmm. And you could see it in his body. Mm -hmm. So I said, I wonder what would happen if we had you lay down and I took a blanket, he laid on the blanket. And if we were to take this large ball and roll it up, we could make it like a pancake. And he loved it and he was giggling. So already the idea of rolling this ball and then who do you want to roll the ball? He said, mom. Then mom and dad, then mom, dad, and little sister. And no matter how much weight they would put on, he wanted more. Yeah. He was begging, I want more pressure, more pressure. At one point, all three of them were sitting on top of the ball, mm -hmm. right on his legs. And he goes, this feels great. Mm -hmm. And they were looking. And then we were able to begin the dialogue yeah. about how he really is experienced in this family mm -hmm. and how to meet his needs. Mm -hmm. And the discussion in the family had been, we're afraid to go on an upcoming family trip to visit a relative who was ill because we're afraid he's going to dot, 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 dysregulate. Mm -hmm. And so we came up with tools and one of them was the deep pressure. Mm -hmm. They purchased weighted blankets mm -hmm. and they gave him space mm -hmm. so that he could have all the pillows, I believe, when they stayed at a family member's house, he was piled up. He called it the pile up or he piled up the pillows. He was king of the pillows. He could sit on top. They could pile them on top. And it allowed him to regulate because he was nine. He didn't want to be the problem. Right. He, didn't, he wanted to break the cycle. Yeah. And mom's experience, and this was so touching, at one point, she became so emotional, realizing the system and how disconnected. Mm -hmm. She said, I feel like you're finally understanding me, and I'm finally understanding you, as she looked at the boy. Mm -hmm. And it was a moment of deep connection that was wonderfully surprising for me. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing. I wasn't going anywhere specifically other than to regulate. Yeah. but I was ready to pivot in the moment mm -hmm. and go with what came up. Mm -hmm. And using that ball, I'm thinking of another child. This was a three and a half year old. We use this on video. You may have seen her at the conference because it was an all day presentation where this little girl that I showed, we call her Ginger because of her red hair. She would pull out her hair. She had um, such a challenge 
with trichotillomania that the doctors wanted her to get therapy, but she didn't want to meet with the suits as the parents described the other doctors before they came to me. Mm -hmm. So you come to my colorful office mm -hmm. and there were no toys, going back to your question, there were balls and scarves and ropes and swings. Those are the toys as opposed to more of what we consider the traditional toys. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, I wanted to use the ball for the same pancake self-regulation. Mm -hmm. She wanted nothing to do with it. She wanted to kick the ball with her feet. Mm -hmm. That became the access route. Mm -hmm. and using the sensory motor psychotherapy nomenclature through her feet and through kicking the ball, yeah. we were able to come up with the story of what needed to happen for her. Hers mm -hmm. was a whole other situation, but it was an example of how I was able to shift, let go of my use of the ball mm -hmm. and learn from the, our mm -hmm. younger clients about where to go and what to do. And in that session, the parents came up with so many wonderful tricks such as if you're working with a child who has a habit that is not a good one, then we could apply this because I have to thumb sucking. Mm -hmm. Often the behavior of the trichotillomania or the thumb sucking, even if it's disastrous for the dental mm -hmm. or some of the other habits that mm -hmm. kids may have happen often in a car. Mm -hmm. So they set up a small ball on the back seat of the car. And as they drove, she would kick the ball mm -hmm. down into the ground. When she would go to bed at night, she had just got her big girl bed. She was three and a half. The big girl bed was big. She didn't have the containment of the crib. We had a half ball, the bossu ball, attached to the back of the headboard. So as she fell asleep, she kicked the ball and she would fall asleep instead of falling asleep by pulling her hair. Just by symptom substitution, we switched to something that was very healthy for her. That intervention was co-created, she and I, this little girl and I, based on my having a different agenda of doing the rolling the ball and realizing that wasn't what her body was asking for. Her energy wanted to come out her feet. <laughs> exactly. That was her access. And we could look at why, but the whys are less important than, wow, look what your feet are wanting to tell us. Let's go with that. And then coming up with all kinds of different interventions with her feet. Amazing. So um, Bonnie, I, I know there's listeners right now that, that want to learn more and want to know where they can go to, um, yeah, to learn more. I want you to, to talk briefly about the, the book that's coming out. So will you let, let our listeners know where they can keep um, hearing more of this great stuff? Perfect timing as our puppy's starting to squeak with the toy. <laughs> SensoryMotorPsychotherapy.org lists all the trainings and we have workshops around the world, but another one of the gifts of these last two years, these so challenging last two years has been sensory motor psychotherapy also has an online training so that we're able to access areas of the world that have wanted to learn but not been able to. So we have in each of the Central America's time zones, different trainers training and international trainings. So from wherever you're listening, you can access the basic foundational training along with reading sensory motor psychotherapy. Um, Pat Ogden, Google her on Amazon, you can get the books. Mm -hmm. For the child workshops, I teach around the world. So check with the sensory motor psychotherapy office and find out when our next child oriented training but when I say child, it's children of all ages, including our adult, uh -huh. and including our parents. Uh -huh. We as parents, and I'm a parent now, I'm a grandparent as well. Parents, grandparents, children, all of those issues, caretakers, uh -huh. are encapsulated uh -huh. in the child lens and the child trainings. I am going to get you some papers so that you'll be able to share that with your reader. And, uh -huh. and I invite a dialogue both with myself. And with any of the sensory motor trainings who are in your area, you can ask them the child related questions because the developmental training really focuses on the early stages of attachment based interactive training. The trauma based or more isolated traumas, either large T traumas, ongoing traumas, chronic traumas, medical traumas, each of those kids also experience. And so we're able to look at, through the lens of childhood, the tools, and then our book. Mm -hmm. um, 
the patience of Norton. <laughs> As we complete this book together, it's been a wonderful labor to be comprehensive mm -hmm. and also brief enough. Mm -hmm. And so um, stay tuned for that book, which the manuscript is nearing completion so that we can get that in and get that out for everybody. Until then, also the Sensory Motor Psychotherapy website. Mm -hmm. You can ask the office, you can access these free workshops that I've done, you can access the articles that I've written that my colleagues have written on some of the adult trainings. Beautiful. What a perfect ending there. <laughs> Our friend is saying, bravo, bravo, bravo. <laughs> and saying, Goodbye, everybody, right. So thank you all for listening and for being part of this and being curious about making a change for your clients and for yourselves. And thank you, Lisa, for having me on the show. Absolutely. Listeners, thank you once again for being a part of this podcast. And uh, as always, take care of yourselves. You are the most important toy in that playroom. For more information on our courses and our classes, please go to our website at synergeticplaytherapy.com and check out what we have available to you. And as always, remember that you're the most important toy in that playroom.